I am here with cybersecurity expert, Jeff Kroon. He's an author, a distinguished engineer, a master inventor, an IBM YouTube personality, even a grandfather. He's got every title that you could possibly imagine. And he is here with me today. He's gonna to answer some cybersecurity questions. So first off, just thank you so much for taking a few minutes out of your extremely busy day. Uh, it's my pleasure, Josh. Good to see you. I'm glad to have the conversation. Absolutely, I appreciate it. So how do I know if I've been hacked? And if I think I have been, what is the thing that I should immediately do? Sounds like a good lawyer answer, but I'm gonna say it depends. Depends on the kind of hack that's been happened uh, that has occurred to you. Unfortunately, in a lot of cases, you won't know. If an attacker is really skilled, they will steal your data and you won't be aware of it. Uh, we have information that shows it takes most companies mean time to, to, to be aware of when they've been attacked. Uh, it could be on the order of almost a year. So a lot of times these things are, are things that have happened in the past and we're only now finding out. Some cases, you might notice if it's on your personal system that there's some odd behaviors on the system. Now, odd behaviors, look, these are computers, so they act, act odd sometimes anyway. So you just reboot it and see if it starts acting the way it should again. But if you start seeing really, really odd behaviors, it's certainly something that is worth investigating. You could get a malware scanner and run it on your system and see if it finds anything. So there's a lot of different kind of telltale signs, but Unfortunately, a lot of cases, we're just not really aware because we don't have the tools in place to to even to even see it in the first place. So this is kind of a two part question. So what is the number one cybersecurity mistake that you see that companies or businesses are making and related to that, but on a more personal level, what is the number one mistake that just people in general are making? I think one of the top mistakes that I've seen just for decades that uh, IT security organizations make is that they love to just, whenever a new technology comes in, they just say, no, don't do it. It's too risky. Don't do that with AI. Yeah, yeah, exactly. AI is the latest turn of the, of the crank on this. But I've been around long enough. I remember when the internet first came out and security organizations just said, no, that internet thing, that is way too dangerous. Don't let any system ever touch that. We can't control it. So, okay, you can you imagine a company today that has no internet connection? No. I mean, yeah. So it's gonna be the same way when it comes to AI. Uh, it's, it, it was the same way when it came out with mobile devices. And companies would say, nope, those things are too risky. You cannot put corporate information on those devices. So don't say no, say how. If you say no, the security department becomes the department of no, and nobody wants to go to a place that only tells them no. And as a result, you drive the behavior underground. And the users will figure out the how if you don't tell them the how. It's far better to, instead of saying, no, don't connect to the internet, which of course is a, everybody does now, or no, don't use AI. I've heard companies say, yeah, we block that. We don't allow that here. Okay, you can block it, but everybody's got a mobile phone and they'll just access it from that and you won't see it and you won't control it and you'll be taken out of the equation. So that's a huge mistake, I think. In fact, I'm planning to do a YouTube video on that literally tomorrow. Uh, on, on just that subject. So so that I think is the huge mistake that companies make and they continue to make that and will be something after AI that they'll just say no to and it'll be a mistake because if you say no, the user figures out how. Better for you to say, here, do it, but do it this way. This is more secure and we can monitor it and control it. Now, number one mistake for users is that they believe that not that everything on the internet is true. Um, and I'm here to tell you, if you get nothing else out of this, not everything on the internet is true. I know for some people that's a shock, but not everything that comes- A lot of aunts and grandmas out there right now who are just the mind- Exactly, and mind blowing, yeah. Uh, you know, it, it, anyone can put anything on the internet. And as a result, they can, for instance, tell you your system's been hacked when it hasn't, and that you need to download this particular tool in order to disinfect it, when in fact, they're the one that is trying to hack your system. And when you download that tool, you just gave them a foothold into your system um, because people will believe what they what they see out there. It's the same thing with AI. AI can tell us things and it can be really great, but sometimes it gives us wrong answers. And we can't just accept everything that the system tells us. We have to think critically, 
And that's going to be, I think, as we move into this era of AI, that is the number one skill that we have to possess. It's uh, as an adjunct professor, one of the things I'm trying to drive into my students is think critically, question everything. Just because the system said it and it sounds good and it has this kind of truthiness feel to it, doesn't mean it is. Uh, we can be misled into all kinds of, of issues. So do you think that AI is making business related cybersecurity attacks better or worse? Definitely. It's fair. Both. Fair answer. <laughs> That's kind of what I expected, actually. Yeah, no, no it's, it's definitely the case. Um, I did one video that was specifically on using agents with AI to improve cybersecurity outcomes. Because an agent could, for instance, uh, be given the right level of autonomy, the right level of skills and capabilities, that it could go off and start an investigation for an incident and maybe even tell you about not only all the systems that are affected, but who did it and what you need to do to remediate with it and maybe even start some of those steps, but be careful about that last bit and do all of that in a faster amount of time, in minutes where it might take a human hours to do that level of research. So that is a way where it could improve cybersecurity outcomes. On the other hand, the bad guys have AI too, and they could use it to make it so that it's basically an amplifier of their capabilities. If they're able to get into your AI or leverage your agent, you know, I just talked about how people can be faked out with bad information. Well, guess what? AI can be too. So if they leverage that and have the AI system, maybe through a prompt injection, tell it to do things that it shouldn't do, and it does, then it becomes the amplifier of their attack. They could also, for instance, you can now with some of these uh, more modern uh, models, you could feed it a vulnerability description and it will generate the code to do the exploit for you. So the bad guys don't even have to know how to write code anymore. They can get literally, uh, here. here's a description of the problem, tell me how to exploit it, and there's all the instructions and they unleash it. So it's going to help both sides. This is what we call a dual use technology. It has good uses, it has bad uses. And um, it's going to be a question of who uses it the best as to who wins. Kind of like social media. Exactly. Double edged sword. Exactly. So what do you think is the biggest cybersecurity attack or threat that's facing both small and large businesses? I say that that way because I know what might affect a small business can be different than what might typically affect a, a larger business. Sure. We continue to see year after year um, that phishing is a huge issue for, for organizations of any size, all the way down to individual consumer level all the way up to the big enterprise. And that, if I remember correctly from the data breach report that just came out, that was like the number one attack. Yep, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. And, and continues to be. And it's because, uh, and so phishing leverages an element of social engineering uh, where, like I was talking about before, people will tend to believe whatever they see on the internet. You get an email, it says it's from your bank. That doesn't mean it is, okay? Don't click on that link, especially. And, and one of the things we've been telling users over the years to try to train them to not fall for these phishing scams is look for spelling errors, grammar errors, and stuff like that. I'm gonna say, please unlearn that from everyone you told that to. Because now the bad guys can use AI to write perfectly crafted emails that have no spelling errors, no grammar errors, and they don't have to be able to speak a word of English. So that can all be AI generated and be very, very convincing. So if we're looking for these sets of clues and don't find them, then we're likely to believe it. And so I'm saying, tell everyone, don't pay any attention to that. Certainly if you see lots of spelling errors, then okay, that's probably an issue. But the lack of it doesn't mean that you should trust it either. Uh, I'm a big proponent of a technology called pass keys to replace passwords. Uh, phishing attacks, th the majority of phishing attacks are after your login credentials. I can't steal your password if you don't have one, because I can't steal something that doesn't exist can't steal your pass key because the pass key is something that has a time basis to it. You can get into the details of this, but it involves cryptographic techniques. You keep the private key on your system. I, you, that private key never leaves your system. So there's nothing for me to steal. The pass key uses a different technology based on that. And that's what you use to log into systems. So if everyone would start using pass keys and individual consumers don't necessarily get a choice in that, Although more and more, you could go like, for instance, my pharmacy's website 
home improvement stores website. Um, a lot of these consumer oriented websites are starting to offer people the option of, would you like to switch to a pass key? And most people are like, the heck is that? No. Right. And I, I think that, yeah, I would say do that. Uh, it's, it's a far more secure technology and you don't have to memorize all these, you know, complex rules and all this kind of stuff and change it over time and all that. That would be one of the best defenses we have against phishing and phishing remains one of the top concerns for companies all the way from the biggest down to the smallest. And what happens if you lose the pass key? Well, so the, the simple answer is the same thing that happens if you lose your password, you go into a system and you reset and get a new one. You know, you answer the questions or whatever. Now there's a whole discussion about whether those challenge questions are any good and on most sites they're not, but that's still the same set of vulnerabilities that we have before. The other thing that also can happen, and I said your private key in that never leaves your system, you can actually set up a, a secure exchange where your private key is synced across multiple devices. And for instance, Apple does this through iCloud, uh, but you can also do this through other password managers where it will sync this across your devices in a secure, reliable way. So that way, if you lose your pass key on one device, if I steal your phone, well, it's still in your cloud account and you can just log in from another system. And then when you get a new phone, download it from there. So there are mitigations and backups uh, to get around that issue. So do you feel like a pass key is safer than, let's say, a password plus like a two-factor authentication? Or is it more like pass key plus two-factor authentication? That's, is that that's it. You, you're never going to use a pass key by itself. You should, um, with, with ASCII, and the international standard for this has come from a group called FIDO, the Fast Identity Online. And FIDO specifies certain devices with their biometric readers and things like that. Like for instance, most mobile phones, uh, you're unlocking it with your face print, you know, or something like that, or fingerprint. So that's one level of, of authentication, one factor. And then the fact that you have the device is a second factor, and then now you've got the pass key on that, uh, uh, actually the private key on that device. So yeah, multi-factor for sure. It's not either or, it's pass key plus multi-factor. It's all built in together. And and I don't have pass key set up as much as I should, but I will say like, I'm a big, big proponent of actually having the keys that, you know, I, don't, I know there's essentially as part of the two-factor authentication where someone will try to log in and you get that six digit code that you have to put in. Cause I mean, I don't know how many times just over the past couple of weeks that I've gotten where someone's trying to hack like my Twitter, which I don't even use anymore. But I'm getting like a notification saying, here's your six digit code you requested. I'm like, yeah. I have to request that. But if I didn't have that set up. That's right. Yeah, that's right. So multi-factor for sure. And that's one, that's one of those uh, one-time passwords that's essentially time-based and is you know valid for 60 seconds. That's one thing you can do. Um, but there's always a little extra complexity in using those kinds of things, extra steps. And you and I are techies. We don't mind doing that in the interest of security because we know the downside and the upside of doing it. Most consumers look at that and say, that's just an annoying right. thing. I don't even want that, yeah. right? So that's why I think for the vast majority of users, it cannot be simpler than you set up the pass key in advance if the website supports it, because that all happens behind the scenes. And then whenever you go to log into the device, you just look at the device, you know, look at your phone, it reads your face, and then you're logged in. So I think that that's the best of all possible use. Unfortunately for a lot of people, I, I and I'm obviously, I'm not a cybersecurity expert, but security in general, I feel like a lot of people, it's almost like home security. It's like some people, they're like, I've never had a home security system. I don't need one. But once they get broken into, they're like, oh man, I need to get a home security system now. It's almost like a... Uh, reactive instead of a proactive. Absolutely. And our perception of risk, like you say, you might say, in my home, in my neighborhood, nobody ever, we, there's no crime here. You know, I leave my door wide open in the middle of the night. Okay, that might be true. But if you are on the internet, you're automatically, by definition, in a bad neighborhood. Because it doesn't matter where you are, the whole world has access to you. So even though your perception of risk may be that there's not much out there, if you saw what I saw, you'd realize that uh, you'd probably break out in hives, but- um, I'm losing some stuff. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> now, there's a lot of cybersecurity people that become very jaded because they see all of this stuff all the time, and that's why they end up with that, say no to everything. Just don't do it. Don't do this, don't do that, don't do anything. Uh, but again, the companies that say no all the time, we get to read about them in the history books. 
because they don't move with the technology. So we've got to find and strike a right balance between how much risk to take and is it calculated risk? And if I put mitigations that make it so that that risk is one that I can control, because you cannot live in a world without risk. We all take risks every single day. So what do you think are the three easiest ways to protect a business right now from hackers? Like what are the three key things they could do? Um, I think make sure that you have your identities, your house in order when it comes to identities and that they're managed well. And again, pass keys are an example of something that does that. Make sure you've deployed at least multi-factor authentication on any system of any real importance. Passwords are not strong enough. Um, uh, another thing is make sure all your data is encrypted if it's of any significance. Um, and there's a lot of things we need to be doing to future proof our encryption as quantum computers come along and that those are going to be able to break all of our existing encryption. But the good news is we have technology, we have better algorithms that can be deployed that will be resistant to those quantum attacks. And then the last thing is make sure that you can see and monitor everything that's going on. You, you can't secure what you can't see. So you want to be able to have a monitoring system in place that makes sure that my identities are being guarded correctly, my data is being secured correctly, and and I have oversight with all of that. So those are the three main areas I would say that would make a big difference. Makes sense. All right, well, again, I just want to thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. It's been awesome. And I hope anyone who's watching this are able to pick up some, some great nuggets of wisdom and if you're not aware of this already, you can search Jeff Kroom's name or go to the IBM YouTube technology channel. He is, he's all over it. He's in, I don't know, probably 60% of the videos, uh, him and Martin Keener and just about all of them. They're absolutely rock stars doing the whiteboard videos. Um, so feel free to go out there. So if you want to deep dive on a lot of the things that he's talked about today, he's either probably made a video about it or he's probably about to make a video about it. If you don't see one, let me know, let him know, and he can make a video about it. So. Thank you again so much for your time and for anyone watching. Thank you for your time and uh, until next time.